join me in welcoming Karen Kitchell and Phil Kilmer. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, I want to thank Evan for setting this all up for us. Um, it's nice for me to have a chance to talk with Karen. We just agreed that we met originally at U-Cross in 2012. Karen was a juror up there. I was uh, bringing my land arts crew. And um, we kind of, I've followed Karen's work ever since. Uh, I want to thank Peter's Gallery for the support they've given U-Cross uh, over the years. It, uh, they've been very generous with us, and we appreciate it. Okay, so uh, the plan for today is I'd like to start with the show right here at the Peters Gallery and then maybe work into some of the other series in your over. Okay. That's okay. Um, hopefully we can drift, drift back and forth between the technical, the aesthetic, and the conceptual. Um, if you know Karen, um, she has a twinkle in her eye, so I have no idea where this is going. Uh, but, you know, we'll saddle up and, and go. Okay, so anyone who uh, sees your work is amazed by your mastery of technique. Um, and I thought maybe it would make sense to begin with you talking a little bit about your process in generating these paintings or just your process as an artist. I'd be happy to start there. Um, I'm self-taught as a painter, although I'm probably better educated than many. <laughs> but um, all my technical information came about through the trial and error school. Um, I had a strong liberal arts education in Kalamazoo, um, and then for a variety of reasons, ended up at a very conceptual graduate program in Claremont. So I got an intellectual work out there, but the painting path is one I've had to dig and build on my own. Um, these particular paintings are both branching forward and also uh, similar to how I've been working for about two decades, which is I do investigative work in a very specific landscape. Uh, I'm not creating from my imagination. Uh, these particular works are all based in Powder River Basin, mm. um, very much connected to a huge amount of imagery I collected during my time as a U-Cross juror. My favorite season was what we finally referred to as the mud season, where everything is just very brown, there might be snow, but um, the signs of life, you really have to uh, believe in them because the landscape is asleep. Um, in, this, in this group of work, I've taken those images that I started with and piled on many hundreds of hours of improvisation, letting the images that are based in reality instead become absorbent platforms into a, a period of time, the two-year period of time that it took me to make these works where I was listening to too many hours of NPR, um, going through too many hours of cold in the studio, too many hours of heat in the studio, and then for the big finale, too many hours of falling ash from the Thomas Fire, which started in Ventura, very close to my home. So the paintings um, are realism, but I urge you all to, to look at the word realism from more than one point of view. It's not optical realism alone, which many people are uh, used to when they're looking at a painting that they think of as real. But for me, the paintings are also literal in that they contain earth materials, ash from the fire, and all that time. So it's realism from more than one point of view. Um, so I think of this work as being part of your larger grassland series and um, you know people have used hyper realist super realist you've gotten a lot of different shades of realism attached to your work which is funny to yeah. me yeah. It's, <laughs> well art world loves loves its terms yeah uh, one of the things that I've seen in this series is that you tend to employ a really tightly cropped um, focused perspective and so can you talk a little bit about how your choices on how you're positioning us as viewers in relationship to uh, the subject matter of the painting itself? Sure, great question. That goes all the way back to um, the early 90s. I moved to Montana in 1990 
and had already uh, determined, much to my alarm, that I was feeling attracted to landscape as a subject. But then when I got to Montana, I found that I was literally surrounded by hundreds of landscape painters, um, many of whom were not particularly adding anything distinct to the conversation or the tradition. So um, the format that I use, the tight cropping, the lack of a horizon line, the lack of a landmark, sometimes e even lack of specific time of day is very much reflective of my point of view rather than a certain view in the traditional mm -hmm. okay. expectation of landscape. So you're seeing a point of view, which is we are embedded in nature, we are part of nature, and nature is not out there. Mm -hmm. So it's a conceptual choice, and I guess I have Claremont to thank for that, that I, right from my first um, efforts, I was very dissatisfied with um, what I found to be the conceptual limits of a, a conventional landscape painting approach mm -hmm. in today's world anyway. This is something else we share. We both were in Claremont, um, not exactly the same time. And I, that's really well said that um, I would not come in and look at your work and say, oh, there's another landscape painter. No, right, that's not good. That. <laughs> yeah. um, so in the uh, announcement, you refer to the fact that you use mineral pigments, you call that out. Could you talk a little bit about the actual stuff that you paint with? Well, the, the most amount of time in my personal history still is traditional oil paint. Mm -hmm. But in about the last four or five years, I've been making some pretty exciting experimental ventures into working with um, tar, asphalt, mm -hmm. ash, and so these paintings, not these, but the ones over here, um, contain some powdered mineral pigments as well. Um, bronze, gold, different things that uh, can be dispersed in a number of carrier vehicles. So in these, in different layers, I would um, throw in some bronze powder and then either flood the canvas with water, sometimes shellac, and then I'd leave that alone for a few days and then go right back to it, whatever the painting seemed to need. So if you, you know, the lighting in here beautifully calls out some of the glitter that comes and goes in some of these. It's a very fine, shiny material that can um, be manipulated in a number of ways. Part of, my, part of my investigation into realism is becoming literal here yeah. and there. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, I'm interested in, in that mix between, as artists, between how we render images, but we're also using real stuff. And I think that dialogue is, we'll get into that a little bit more, I hope. Um, in this series, the dominant um, image is the realist grass, but there's this uh, evocative background thing going on here. And it doesn't operate in the same way uh, in terms of how imagery is read, I would say, as the, the primary grass thing. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the grasses and the background and, and that dialogue you're creating in this work? Well, optically it appears as a background, um, but particularly in these on canvas, it's structurally almost a glaze as mm -hmm. well, but I, I think I know what you mean. Once I decided the work was reflecting primarily on the condition of deprivation, of drought, I thought it might be um, meaningful and give viewers something to look forward to if I included um, a memory or a hope of something fluid. Mm -hmm. And so some of this deep Payne's gray or blackish um, material in the background with the bubble patterns literally was made with water or water and oil pooling together so that I'm not literally showing water or a water surface but water is part of a process of how that surface was derived hmm. and water was part of my meditation as I'm you know praying as we all are for this drought to let up. Right. Well, we're all familiar with that one, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess the, the step further I'd like to take that is that in this painting, um, there is a lightness, 
But in general, the surrounding area of the image has a darkness to it. And um, I assume that's more than just a purely playing the grays and blacks against the, uh, the color of the straw. Oh, sure. It's a, you know, these are dark times. And I know many of us are coping in various ways. Um, I cannot really disengage myself from these times. And I'm an emotional person. So the paintings were becoming incredibly dark. And dark in mood, um, dark in the number of hours. You know, they were, they've been finished many times <laughs> from an optical point of view. Mm -hmm. Um, they looked almost like this, but not as good 12 months ago. Yeah. So I continue, and the, the pathways and the repetition in the surfaces become their, their own topography in a way. Mm -hmm. And again, the lighting in here is so exquisite, it lets you see the image and the gesture more than the struggle. But if you, you know, if you really look to the side, or if you're one of my family or friends who visited me during this two-year process, you know, the struggle was plenty deep. And some of it was emotional, some of it was despair, and a lot of it has to do with the subject matter. But I tried to continue until I could bring them out into the light outside of my studio, and they're still not, you know, completely happy paintings, but I think they allow for possibility now is, is where I try to leave them. Okay, so that, um, that sort of already begins to answer my next question. I was reading your website, and uh, you say in that, I'm disturbing the notoriously romantic terrain of landscape painting. And so uh, can you talk a little bit more about sort of that tradition and now how you're uh, taking it forward? To a different place. It's a big topic. Yeah, it is. It's big. Um, I have been working from a conceptual point of view for a really long time, and a lot of my undisclosed motivations were called into question the first time I was publicly called a realist. Mm -hmm. And it's when the Denver Art Museum made a massive acquisition of my early grassland works and the funding was from the contemporary realist group and at that time 1997 I didn't even really know what contemporary realism was and then when I started to see my contemporary realist colleagues I thought do we really have that much in common so I, I tried to school myself as as they say to become um, equally aware of technique history and intent mm -hmm. and, and and I try to explore those both separately and and together so I accept and I'm aware and I am pretty well educated now about the landscape history to tradition in which I find myself and I don't reject that tradition it's one of the reasons I, I have stayed operating in oil paint because I, I consciously am staying Connected to that tradition, mm -hmm. so so for me, I could you know I could be doing this in a number of uh, other materials, but I would lose that connection mm -hmm. in a way that's meaningful to me. So I'm a landscape painter. I'm trying to continue to extend my mastery of the traditional materials. I'm adding materials that I think are significant to the conversation but I've intentionally thrown out many of the inherited formats, the, the horizon line, the pastoral, um, even though there's an absence of human actors, what I choose and how I show them um, are a direct result of human actors <laughs> and human occupants of the landscape. So, I mean, that's kind of a wordy answer. No, that's good. But um, they are landscape paintings. I'm just mm -hmm. not going to serve it up uh, the way you're used to seeing them. And we have to maybe start from a different point of view in the conversation. One thing I, I um, like to say is that I'm not painting views. I'm showing you a point of view, mm -hmm. which, you know, is really an attitude. <laughs> so... 
Yeah. Well, we like attitude. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm a natural redhead. It's true. <laughs> So you mentioned earlier um, that you're now using asphalt emulsion and tar and other uh, elements, other materials in your paintings that maybe are more generally associated with industrial processes than art, art processes. Um, and I'm curious about your intent in choosing those materials as a way to drive our reading of the images. Um, Karen also has a series, if you go on her website, that's called the Waterway Series. and um, it touches on, you know, an element that's really important to us here, uh, Aguas Vida, you okay, know. Um, and so this is in our discussion all the time. Uh, so when I come to a painting about water and I see it in uh, being rendered in asphalt and tar, I want to ask the artist. <laughs> well, it started my inquiry into the um, materials in the petroleum family really came about first because I was struggling with this conversation about realism. I mean, my husband Gary can confirm, I often come home from exhibitions <laughs> distraught that um, so many things are going unsaid or undisclosed. Like When we look at realist art, we're all supposed to just agree with it the tricks of the, of the optical presentation. And to me, I use those skills and methods as a delivery system, not as a, a trick to show you what I can do to make a certain kind of picture. Mm -hmm. I, I really use it as a delivery system. Mm -hmm. So um, the asphalt started when I was trying to paint my local landscape in you know central coast California has got you know, oil problems all over, you know, the birds, the water, the dirt, the, it, um, so I, it was really just a kind of a ham-fisted effort at first to put the truth mm -hmm. in one of these paintings, yeah. put the stuff in the paintings, mm -hmm. and then I found out, wow, 35 years of working with oil paint has made me kind of a good uh, manipulator <laughs> with the with the asphalt too, because yeah, it's basically a cousin. It, yeah. it works the same. Yeah. And then the more I read about it, I found out asphaltum uh, has a pretty long history being used in combination with oil paints. Mm -hmm. Often it gets a bad rap as being unstable, but I, because of what I know about conventional oil painting methods, I've got a lot of knowledge on how to make it serve me <laughs> instead mm -hmm. of vice versa. Yeah. So that's how it started. Yeah. But then when you introduce it into subjects having to do with water or landscape, it, it becomes so powerful yeah. and undeniable and helps move my images forward into um, a channel beyond just a pretty picture. Yeah. I mean, I know they're pretty. I want them to be because I want to give you something to dwell on. And if, if things are too painful, we just look away. So. Yeah, so we've now moved kind of, I think, to this, uh, this other place in this conversation um, where we're talking about environmental art as much as we're talking about painting. We're talking about um, the artist's role um, in society in driving the conversation around questions. Um, and that's something that I think people can come and, and see your work because it's so beautiful and not be even cognizant of. Sure. Um, there's another series in uh, Karen's body of work. Uh, well, there's two other series. Uh, one's called Botanicals and the other is called Agriculture. And uh, I think everyone here is familiar with the native and invasive species conversation that's going on in Santa Fe. Like we're, we're heavily involved in, in, in this conversation. Um, so I'm interested if, if you see your, again, your work as being a way to to drive that conversation or frame that conversation or is it just an expression of your interest in that conversation? Well, it, um, it, I hope it adds to the conversation but only in terms of who's thinking about it in the art world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not kidding myself. Art often exists separate from um, 
what the average person is thinking about when they go about their business. Mm -hmm. And these paintings aren't going to uh, clean up the water in Flint, for example. You know, in my experience, and I've been doing this a long time now, art often functions either as decor mm -hmm. or as a placeholder or a platform for some kind of intellectual conversation. Mm -hmm. So my work functions in both of those realms, but it, it's not decor without a little poke. Because <laughs> I, I want it to be a source of remembrance and conversation and maybe inspiration. Mm -hmm. But it's not the same as you know, people that are picking up trash. But I do that too. <laughs> Yeah, I, this is, you know, obviously I run, started art and ecology at UNM, I run the land arts program. This is topics that are very close to uh, our conversation uh, with my students and that community of artists. And this question of what is the relationship between aesthetics and activism, moral, ethics, all those questions, and, and can you have aesthetics that is amoral, not, yeah, amoral, not immoral, amoral, or is aesthetics inherently involved with uh, que questions of our morality? I think it's, you know, is, is one that as contemporary artists who are living in this world, we have to be aware of. And I guess um, my crew certainly hopes that this ability that we have to speak in a visual language and to communicate through aesthetics can in some way help drive the conversation. That the topics that you, are involved in are very serious topics. But there's a joy in this room through just the brilliance of your talent as an artist that makes me at least able to spend a little longer getting into the topic than if you had slogans saying, you know, there's tar everywhere. Um, so I guess I'm curious if in your experience you're finding that this, this is working, that the people who come to your show are getting both the aesthetics and, uh, and some ability to at least consider these well, other issues. Well, there's not one audience. I mean, yeah. yes, of course. But some people look to art for their restoration. Mm -hmm. Other people need it for confirmation. Mm -hmm. Some people want to forget. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm becoming more and more open to understanding how diverse not just artists are, but how diverse audiences are. And, um, you know, the prices are posted here. I have very elite helpers mm -hmm. <laughs> investing in this work right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that's come about through a number <laughs> of stories and decades of working on this. Right. But um, I support this conversation in other ways too. But as you can see, my professional gifts have to do with aesthetics and I believe in their, their value. Mm -hmm. So, um, for me, I think the biggest thing I'm bringing to the conversation of an ethical and environmental concern in art is to not assume or act as though the conversation stopped in the 1880s. Mm -hmm. To me, if you can't tell by looking at a landscape painting, what century it was made in, let alone what decade, that's not for me. You know, I'm not going to make that. Yeah. Other people might make it, other mm -hmm. people might want it, mm -hmm. but that's not my area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It used to make me really upset, but now I just say it's not my area. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we share. Um, I mean, I think you have to stay in the contemporary conversation if you're going to have any, any real effect. It's really fun to talk about these things. Thanks for being here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go.